And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the service for the Sunday after Christmas, December 27th. And we're glad to have you with us here at the Community Church of New Boston, New Hampshire. And we reach people coast to coast. It's kind of amazing on Facebook sometimes when you see where some of the folks are watching from. So it's great. I want to begin by just thanking uh, a lot of people who have made Advent as special as, as it could be uh, under very adverse circumstances. Uh, Sam and Karina and Paul, of course, uh, they were not only here last every Sunday during this, but they were here last Sunday at four o'clock for a virtual carol sing that really was uh, terrific. I was watching that at home, and it was just a great event uh, until Mark Zuckerberg intervened because something was played, I guess, from fa on Facebook Live. One of the songs was, was copyrighted or some such thing, so I don't know. But anyway, that was a terrific thing. And then um, uh, our service on Christmas Eve, again, uh, a lot of special help. Uh, the folks I already mentioned, and uh, Molly, who came to play the uh, cello for us, uh, that was a great event. We had uh, a Christmas, not only a virtual carol sing uh, last Sunday, but we had on Christmas Eve a drive-through candle lighting, which was uh, made possible by Scott Hunter and Lynn Wozniak and her daughter Laura and my granddaughter Katie. And uh, we're grateful for that. And two weeks ago, we gave out uh, our food and gifts for Christmas. We've had a few folks since then that we've helped as well. But uh, that's thanks to the efforts of Deanna Powell with the food and Barbara Ballou with the gifts. And uh, just grateful for all, all those folks and other people that have helped us along the way. We will have a session if anybody wants to kind of discuss things at four o'clock, uh, say and pray. You can find out how to link on to that uh, on our website, uh, communitychurchnewboston.org. I also wanted to mention that the food pantry now has an addition to it, thanks to Lori Kyer's idea. Uh, we have food, uh, pet food in the now in the food pantry. She uh, called me one day, uh, a week or so ago and said that 
She was concerned she was hearing that people were turning in pets to shelters because they couldn't afford to take care of them. Now, I don't know if that was particularly around here or just nationally, but whatever the case, we have cat food and we have dog food now uh, in the food pantry, thanks to the generosity of people. And I wanted to mention, you know, during the baseball season, they have promotional things like Bat Day or Ladies Day or, you know, uh, Baseball Hat Day. Well, today is Dick, is not Dick Van Dyke Day, but it's Henry Van Dyke Day. I don't know if they're related. But we have uh, one scripture reading from the scripture, but we have another very good reading written by Henry Van Dyke, a man who was born in the 1850s, became a, a congregational clergyman and also a prolific writer. And he provides one of our readings, and he also provides the sermon. Uh, I'm going to read the story of the other wise man. And if you have not heard that, I think you will find it very enjoyable. It's uh, a great story by Henry Van Dyke. So I think that's all the announcements. Anybody else have any announcements? Hearing none, we uh, move ahead with our morning prelude. We gather to praise God and to thank God for the great gifts he gave us at first Christmas, uh, when his word became flesh and dwelt among us and now continues to dwell among us in his spirit full of grace and truth. And our opening hymn is Joy to the World, number 270. We're going to do verses 1, 2, and 4.
And let us bow together in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we gather to worship you, to listen for the words of the baby of Bethlehem, who you sent into our midst as your word, taking on flesh, to teach us who you are, and to teach us how to live in peace together. We offer a special prayer for those who have struggled during this Advent season in so many different ways due to the situation in which our world finds itself. May we look forward to a new year, and with your help, may we make it a much better year and a much better life for the entire earth. Be with us, we ask, as we worship. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first reading is from Henry Van Dyke. It's called Keeping Christmas. I'm reading it out of a book called A Family Christmas, which was put together by Caroline Kennedy. It is a good thing to observe Christmas Day, the mere marking of time and seasons when people agree to stop work and make merry together is a wise and wholesome custom. It helps one to feel the supremacy of the common life over the individual life. It reminds a person to set their own little watch now and then by the great clock of humanity. But there is a better thing than the observance of Christmas Day, and that is keeping Christmas. Are you willing to forget what you have done for other people and to remember what other people have done for you? To ignore what the world owes you and to think what you owe the world. To put your rights in the background and your duties in the middle distance and your chance to do a little more than your duty in the foreground. To see that your fellow human beings are just as real as you are and try to look behind their faces to their hearts, hungry for joy. To own that probably the only good reason for your existence is not what you're going to get out of life, but what you are going to give to life. To close your book of complaints against the management of the universe and to look around you for a place where you can sow a few words of happiness. Are you willing to do these things even for a day? Then you can keep Christmas. Are you willing to stoop down and consider the needs and the desires of little children? To remember the weakness and loneliness of people who are growing old? To stop asking how much your friends love you and ask yourself whether you love them enough? To bear in mind the things that other people have to bear on their hearts? to try to understand what those who live in the same house with you really want without waiting for them to tell you, to trim your lamp so that all will have more light and less smoke, and to carry it in front of you so your shadow will fall behind you, to make a grave for your ugly thoughts and a garden for your kindly feelings. With the gate open, are you willing to do these things even for a day then you can keep Christmas. Are you willing to believe that love is the strongest thing in the world, stronger than hate, stronger than evil, stronger than death, and that the blessed life which began in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago is the image and bright, brightness of the eternal love? Then you can keep Christmas. And if you keep it for a day, why not always? But you can never keep it alone. Now Sam has an anthem for us. Sea of hurt, oh come, 
Beautifully done. Thank you, Sam and Karina. Our second uh, scripture reading picks up the story of the wise men after they have visited Jesus. We left off uh, the other night uh, with verse 12 of the second chapter of Matthew. Um, uh, then they returned to their country by another road since God had warned them in a dream not to go back to Herod. You remember that Herod asked them to, if they found this child, it was going to be the new king being born, to come back and tell him uh, where that child was so he could go and worship. He actually didn't want to go and worship. He wanted to go kill that child uh, because he was the king. He didn't want another, he didn't want any competition, I guess we could say. So we pick this up with verse 13 of the second chapter of Matthew. After they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph and said, Herod will be looking for the child in order to kill him. So get up, take the child and his mother, and escape to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you to leave. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and left during the night for Egypt, where he stayed until Herod died. This was done to make true what the Lord had said through the prophet, I called my son out of Egypt." When Herod realized that the visitors from the east had tricked him, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its neighborhood 
who were two years old and younger. This was done in accordance with what he had learned from the visitors about the time when the star had appeared. In this way, what the prophet Jeremiah had said came true, a sound is heard in Ramah, the sound of bitter weeping. Rachel is crying for her children. She refuses to be comforted, for they are dead. And here ends our reading. And Sam uh, has a children's sermon for us. Well, good morning, everybody, and I hope everybody had a wonderful Christmas Day with family. Um, this week's lesson, Mrs. Worsniak is using activity, her activity is using cards to retell and sequence the Christmas story. So um, in talking about that, she and I were talking about all the different versions of the story, the multiple stories in the Bible. Um, there's picture books, there's baby board books, there's videos, um, there's, she's even posted a graphic novel on the website about uh, the Christmas story. We see live nativities. There are so many different versions of this story. Um, so I hope you'll join in because she is going to use those stories, those sequence cards to retell the story. And every single version, no matter how different they are, they all tell the same story of hope, love, and joy. Merry Christmas, and I hope you have a wonderful new year. Thank you, Sam and Mrs. Wozniak. That's a great message. And we're going to have one of the versions of a Christmas story. This one's not in the Bible. It's kind of extended off what we just read. Um, it's called The Other Wise Man by Henry Van Dyke. I will uh, pass along a historical fact I came across this week. Um, very interesting one if you think about it. Did you know that a, a thousand years ago, the boomerang was Australia's primary export? Also uh, their primary import. Okay, well, here's the story of The Other Wise Man as written by uh, Henry Van Dyke. His name is Artaban. Artaban lived in Ekbatana, among the mountains of Persia. He was a tall, dark man of about 40 years with brilliant eyes under his broad brow. His robe was of pure white wool thrown over a tunic of silk and a white pointed cap with long lapels at the side rested on his flowing black hair. This was the dress of the Magi. He welcomed to his home one starry evening nine friends of differing ages, but all Parthenian nobles. As the fire rose, it cast a bright illumination through the whole apartment, revealing its simplicity and splendor. Artaban told of the study he and three of his other friends had made of the ancient writings and the stars that indicated the imminent coming of the Blessed One the Messiah. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall arise out of Israel. The words from Numbers, the 24th chapter, the 17th verse. All of his friends listened intently, but all of them said they could not and or would not accompany him on his journey. His oldest and most loving friend said, it is better to follow even the shadow of the best than to remain content with the worst. And those who would see wonderful things must often be ready to travel alone. Go in peace. When all his friends had gone, Artaban went out on the roof and observed the stars. As he watched, a steel blue spark was born out of the darkness beneath, tiny and infinitely remote, yet perfect in every part. It is the sign, he said. The king is coming, and I will go to meet him. Before the birds had fully roused, the other wise man was in the saddle riding swiftly westward. It was a 10-day ride to the appointed meeting place with the other three of his friends that were going, the temple of the seven spheres. Late into the night and in the morning, long before sunrise, Artaban was in the saddle. Through the fertile fields of Congabar, among rich gardens watered by fountains from the rock, 
Over many a cold and desolate pass, down many a black mountain gorge, past Seleucia, which Alexander the Great built, across the swirling floods of Tigris, in the many channels of the Euphrates he traveled, until he arrived at nightfall on the tenth day beneath the shattered walls of populous Babylon. But the temple was a three hours journey still, and his horse, Vazda, was almost spent. As they pressed on, the horse sighed with apprehension. There was something wrong. The dim starlight revealed the form of a man lying across the road. He was a poor Hebrew exile, almost dead, in the grip of a deadly fever. Should he turn aside, if only for a moment, from the following of the star to give a cup of cold water to a poor, perishing Hebrew? God of truth and purity, he prayed, direct me in the holy path, the way of wisdom, which only you know. He brought water from a nearby canal and mixed a potent remedy, which he carried always in his girdle, for the Magians were physicians. Hour after hour he labored. At last the man's strength returned. He sat up and looked around him. I am going to Jerusalem, said Artaban, in search of the one who was to be born king of the Jews, a great prince and deliverer of all people. I can tell you where the Messiah might, must be sought, said the Hebrew, not in Jerusalem, but in Bethlehem. May the Lord bring you safely to that place, because you have shown mercy to the sick. The first beams of the sun cast a long shadow as horse and rider reached the temple of the seven spheres. Artaban could see no trace of his friends. Under a little cairn of broken bricks was a piece of papyrus. We have waited past the midnight, it read, and can delay no longer. We go to find the king. Follow us across the desert. How can I cross the desert, said Artaban, with no food and a spent horse? I must return to Babylon, sell my sapphire, and buy a train of camels and provisions for the journey. I may never overtake my friends. Only God the merciful knows I shall not lose the sight of the king because I tarried to show mercy. Once he purchased camels and supplies for the journey, he set out to the land of the Hebrews. There was the cruel desert, arid and inhospitable mountain ranges, shifting hills of treacherous sand, fierce heat by day, and bitter, blighting chill at night. Then the gardens and orchards of Damascus, watered by the streams of Abana and Fafar, the long snowy ridge of Hermon, the valley of the Jordan, and the blue waters of the Lake of Galilee, and finally, Bethlehem. It was the third day after the three wise men had come to that place, and had found Mary and Joseph with the young child Jesus, and had laid their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh at his feet. I surely shall find him, said the other wise man, though I be alone and later than my brothers. This is the place of which the Hebrew exile told me that the prophets had spoken, and here I shall behold the rising of the great light. The streets seemed deserted, from the open door of a cottage, he heard the sound of a woman's voice singing softly, hushing her baby to rest. She told him of the strangers from the Far East who had appeared in the village three days ago, and how they had said that a star had guided them to the place where Joseph of Nazareth was lodging with his wife and her newborn child, and how they had paid reverence to the child and given him many rich gifts. But, she said, the travelers disappeared again as suddenly as they had come. The man of Nazareth took the child and the child's mother and fled away that same night secretly. Ever since, there had been a spell upon the village. Something evil hangs over it. They say the Roman soldiers are coming to force a new tax upon us. As Otterban listened, the child in her arms looked up in his face and smiled. It seemed like a greeting of love and trust to one who had journeyed long in loneliness and perplexity, fighting with his own doubts and fears. The young mother set food before him. Artaban accepted it gratefully, and as he ate, 
The child fell into a happy slumber, and a great peace filled the room. Suddenly, there was a shout from the streets, the soldiers, the soldiers of Herod, they are killing our children. The young mother's face grew white with terror. She clasped her child to her bosom and crouched motionless in the darkest corner of the room, covering him with the folds of her robe, lest he should wake and cry. Artaban went quickly and stood in the doorway of the house. His broad shoulders filled the portal from side to side, and the peak of his white cap all but touched the lintel. The soldiers came hurrying down the street with bloody hands and dripping swords. At the sight of the stranger in his imposing dress, they hesitated with surprise. I am alone in this place, Artaban said, and I am waiting to give this jewel in my hand to the prudent captain who will leave me in peace. He showed the ruby, glistening in the hollow of his hand like a great drop of blood. The captain was amazed at the splendor of the gem. He stretched out his hand and took the ruby. March on, he cried to his men. There is no child here. The house is empty. Artaban prayed, God of truth, forgive my sin. I have said the thing that is not to save the life of a child. Two of my gifts are gone. Shall I ever be worthy to see the king, the face of the king? But the voice of the woman, weeping for joy in the shadow behind him, said very gently, Because you have saved the life of my little one, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord is fa make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Artaban traveled on to Egypt, seeking everywhere in crowded cities, at the foot of the pyramids, and even looking into the face of the crouching sphinx. He found himself in an obscure house of Alexandria, taking counsel with a Hebrew rabbi. The Messiah, read the rabbi with a parchment, will be despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Those who seek him will do well to look among the poor and the lowly, the sorrowful and the oppressed. And so he traveled from place to place, he visited the oppressed and the afflicted in the gloom of subterranean prisons and the crowded wretchedness of slave markets and the weary toil of gallery ships. Though he found none to worship, he found many to help. He fed the hungry and clothed the naked and healed the sick and comforted the captive. And his years passed more swiftly than the weaver's shuttle that fl flashes back and forth through the loom while the web grows and the pattern is completed. Three and thirty years of the life of Artaban had passed away, and he was still a pilgrim and a seeker after light. His hair, once darker than the cliffs of Zagros, was now white as the wintry snow that covered them. His eyes, which had once flashed like flames of fire, were dull as embers smoldering among the ashes. Worn and weary and ready to die, but still looking for the king, he had come for the last time to Jerusalem. He had often visited the holy city before and had searched all its lanes and crowded hovels and black prisons without finding any trace of the family of the Nazarenes who had fled from Bethlehem long ago. But now it seemed as if he might make one more effort. He must make it and something whispered in his heart that at last he might succeed. It was the season of Passover. The city was thronged with foreigners. Artaban joined a group of people from his own country, Parthenian Jews, who had come up to keep the Passover and acquired of them the cause of the tumult and where they were going. We are going, they said, to a place called Golgotha, where there is to be an execution. Two famous robbers are to be crucified, and with them another, called Jesus of Nazareth, a man who has done many wonderful works among the people so that they love him greatly. Pontius Pilate sent him to the cross because he said he was the king of the Jews. 
Those words felt familiarly, strangely familiar to Artaban. They were words that had led him a lifetime over land and sea. And now they came to him like a message of despair. Could it be that the king had arisen, but he had been rejected, and now he was about to die? But he said to himself, the ways of God are stranger than the thoughts of men. It may be that I will find the king at last in the hands of his enemies and will come in time to offer my pearl for his ransom before he dies. Just then a group of soldiers came dragging a young girl down the street. She was, she said, daughter of a merchant of Parthia, but her father was dead and she was being sold as a slave to pay his debts. Have pity on me and save me. I'm the daughter of a true religion of the Magi. Save me from a fate worse than death. Artaban trembled. It was the old conflict in his soul which had led him in the palm in Bethlehem grove of Babylon and in the cottage in Bethlehem. The conflict between the expectation of faith and the impulse of love. Twice the gift he had consecrated to the worship of religion had been drawn to the service of humanity. This was the third trial, the final in irrevocably, an irrevocable choice. Was it his great opportunity or his lost and last temptation? He could not tell. One thing only was clear. It was inevitable. And does not the inevitable come from God? And was not the deed of love what he must do? He took the pearl, the last of his treasures, from his bosom. Never had it seemed so luminous, so radiant, so full of tender, living luster. He laid it in the hand of the slave. This is your ransom, daughter. It is the last of my treasures, which I have kept for the king. Just then came an earthquake. The walls of the houses rocked to and fro. Stones were loosened and crashed into the street. A heavy tile shaken from the roof fell and struck the old man on the temple. He lay breathless and pale, with his gray head resting on the young girl's shoulder and the blood trickling from the wound. Artaban knew that the quest was over and it had failed. But even that thought produced some peace. It was not resignation or submission. It was something more profound and searching. He knew that all was well. He had done the best that he could from day to day and had been true to the light that had been given him. He knew that even if he could live his life over again, it would not be otherwise than it had been. There came a voice through the twilight, very small and still, like music sounding from a distance, in which the notes are clear but the words are lost. The girl turned to see if someone had spoken from the window above, but she saw no one. Then the old man's lips began to move, as if to answer, and she heard him say in the Parthenian tongue, Not so, my lord, for when did I see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did I see you an alien and take you in, or naked and clothed you? When did I see you sick or in prison and come to you? Three and thirty years I have looked for you, but I have never seen your face nor ministered to you, my king. The sweet voice came again, faint and far away. But now it seemed as though she understood the words. Truly, I say to you, Inasmuch as you have done it, for one of the least of these, my brothers or sisters, you have done it to me. A calm radiance of wonder and joy lighted the pale face of Artaban, like the first ray of dawn on a snowy mountain peak. A long breath of relief exhaled gently from his lips. His journey had ended. His treasures were accepted. 
the other wise man had found the king. The story of the other wise man by Henry Van Dyke as abridged, made a bit shorter, by Donald Wolfram. And so we sing our closing hymn, which is number 288. It's We Three Kings. You can put We Four Kings in there if you'd like to. Do verses one through three. God, in the midst of this season, we thank you for stories and traditions and words which remind us that the story of Bethlehem remains alive and in our midst, in the spirit of the child of Bethlehem. May we follow his words. May we structure our lives in ways that we might help others. May we reach out in love, in forgiveness, and compassion and in peace. We ask for your help on days when we are troubled and for help for each person on this globe who finds days in which they are sad, desperate, afraid. Bring your comfort in the spirit of that child who became a Messiah, a Prince of Peace. We offer our prayer in his name with the prayer which he taught us praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thou art the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, now and forever. Now may the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace, now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.